Welcome everybody. We're just going to give a moment for the broadcast to start and everybody to virtually file in and then we will start the event. All right, good evening, good afternoon, depending where you are. My name is Carmel Schaffer, and I'm the executive director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. I am delighted to be hosting this event in conjunction with the Edmund J. Safra Center. This is going to be an event in which we discuss a roadmap to testing whose purpose it is to get us to a point where we have achieved some measure of resilience against the pandemic. As you know, COVID will be impacting our way of life until there is a vaccine or treatment, most likely. Unfortunately, we don't have a vaccine or treatment right now, but what we do have is the ability to test people. The Safra Center has been working very hard over the last several months to marshal scholars from a variety of disciplines to think about what we need to do to prepare to meet the challenges of the pandemic. One very important piece that they've identified in their rapid response papers, which I highly recommend that you go read, they're available on the Sacra Center's website, please check them out, is around testing, both building the capacity, infrastructure, the political structures to support widespread testing. Before I introduce our panelists, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, if you have questions, I encourage you to put them in the Q&A channel of the Zoom, if you're part of the Zoom. It's down towards the bottom of your screen. Now, when you put the question in, other people won't be able to see it. You might not even be able to see it, but I promise you that I can see it and I'll be weaving in your questions throughout this moderated discussion. If you're on the Facebook Live, there are other channels. If you get it to the members of the Edmund J. Saffer Center, they will get it to me and we will try to answer as many of your questions. As I mentioned, this is a moderated discussion. We'll be really diving into it with our three panelists for the course of an hour. I also wanna plug that this is not the only pandemic resilience event that is going to be happening. Next week at this time, we will be discussing issues around work and school. So especially if you are the parents of small children, wondering when your kids will ever get back to see their friends, and more importantly, off your couch, I think that is the event for you. With that out of the way, I would like to introduce our esteemed panelists. First, we have Danielle Allen who is the James Bryant Conant University Professor at Harvard University, as well as the Director of Harvard's Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. She's also really been the spearheading force behind these rapid response papers. We also have Ganesh Siddharman, Chancellor, Faculty Fellow, Professor of Law, and Director of the Program on Law and Government at Vanderbilt Law School. And then we have Len Weil, Microsoft's Office of the Chief Technology Officer, political economist and social technologist, and the founder and chair of the Radical Exchange Foundation. With that, I would like to welcome all three of you to our virtual event. Danielle, as the head of the Edmund J. Saffer Center and really the leader of the Rapid Response Project, could you tell us a little bit about the Safra Center's Pandemic Resilience Roadmap Project? I'm happy to, Carmel. Thank you so much for the introduction and for um, organizing this panel. It's a great chance to talk about the body of work. The important thing to say about the Rapid Response Initiative was that right from the get-go, a network of faculty affiliated with the center recognized the need for an integrated response to the pandemic. We recognize that the questions facing the country weren't just health questions, 
They weren't just economic questions. They were both of those things, but there were also questions of civil liberties. There were also the questions of how democracy survives in a crisis, passes through a crisis, with the foundations for constitutional democracy intact. So we thought it was really important to build a conversational space that could bring together experts from across those domains to see if there was a way of finding security for our society that protects lives and livelihoods simultaneously, and that does that in a way that is also protective of liberties. So lives, liberties, and livelihoods, we needed a policy pathway that could achieve all of those things. So that was our goal. We set to work with public health experts, with medical experts, epidemiologists, lawyers, philosophers, political scientists, uh, technologists, the whole gamut. And it really did take all those kinds of expertise to figure out what the pathway was. The pathway is you need a tool that controls the disease that doesn't also kill the economy. Collective national quarantine is a tool that does indeed kill the disease, but it also kills the economy. So you have to figure out an alternative tool, equally powerful to collective national quarantine for controlling the disease, but that does not have those negative side effects. And that alternative tool is if we test ourselves, test one another, um, if we are COVID positive, we trace our contacts, test all our contacts, find more positive people and keep following the disease along the chain of transmission until you can find all those cases, isolate people who are positive, and then you take the disease out of circulation, but the economy can continue to be active, people can circulate in the economy. So that was the integrated solution, lots to say about liberties in that picture as well. Um, but that's what we have been advocating for since late March. And love to talk about it, love to answer questions about the details of this, how you actually implement it and make it happen, but that's the broad picture. So before we dive a little bit deeper into that, I want to ask Glenn and Ganesh, how did you guys come to be involved with this project? So uh, maybe I'll start. I think I got in a little bit earlier than Ganesh. So um, Danielle and I uh, have been exchanging ideas for many years now, uh, and increasingly so recently. And I think right at the start of uh, her effort, I was simultaneously worried about this issue of integrated response and a lot of experts doing things in their own lane. I was seeing it a little bit more from the economics perspective, where people were taking sort of a standard oh, we need a standard Keynesian stimulus package rather than thinking about the public health nature of the problem. Um, and we ended up coming together around that and really from the very start uh, developing ideas uh, with the whole group and especially uh, the two of us in a very deeply integrated way across these different perspectives. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it there, but. Yeah, I was uh, introduced to, to Danielle and the group um, uh, earlier, uh, I guess now uh, a number of weeks ago, um, and particularly wanted to, to help out on the, the kind of policy development side. You know, a big chunk of um, how we think through a challenge like this is how do we think through the institutions that are needed in order to, um, in order to execute. And a large part of that is what are the legal structures that are available to us and what are the ways we would um, design a policy in order to accomplish that. And so I um, was excited to, to help out in, in that way. So Ganesh is being too modest, if I could just jump in for a second and say, right, because again, it's to that point of integrated expertise. We, even within law, we had to integrate expertise, right? Because we needed people who understood public health law, such as yourself, Carmel, and could you know, understand what the emergency powers are of a state, but we also needed constitutional lawyers um, like Ganesh who could really help us think about what does it mean to design something like a war production board, the sort of pandemic testing board we called it, that could activate the supply chain to really deliver testing at scale. And if it turns out the White House doesn't want to do that, what are your other constitutional avenues for actually achieving this? So Ganesh developed the um, argument that we should um, really activate interstate compacts um, to provide the infrastructure for policy implementation. And again, you know, an economist couldn't have had a, come up with that idea. A philosopher couldn't have come up with that idea. But our pathway of testing had, in essence, you know, no reality without that policy implementation piece. So that's a sort of beautiful example of how you have to integrate expertise to solve these really gigantic human and social problems. So before we move forward to explore the proposals and recommendations in the roadmap itself, one question I have there's a ton of noise and chatter out there about what people should be doing or shouldn't be doing. How would you say that this project distinguishes itself from all of the 
talking heads and op-eds, et cetera, that have been written on what the next step should look like. I think there are a lot of things to say, um, and let me also say a few, but then invite my colleagues to as well. Um, I mean, in the beginning, I think there was a big sort of upswell of desire on the part of academics to write op-eds. Um, and I am a lucky, fortunate person. I write a column for the Washington Post, so I have sort of experience in that space of trying to contribute to the public conversation. And it was very clear to me that op-eds were nothing but froth. Um, more or less so many sort of opinions um, blown about um, in turbulent winds. And that if you actually wanted to make a difference, you really needed to build a solid research basis um, for any claim. So that if a person was interested in your argument, they could actually take a deeper dive into supporting white papers and think the issue through comprehensively. I, at the end of the day, I don't think op-eds on their own permit the kind of sustained thinking that you need in the context of a crisis. So we really wanted to share knowledge that as I saw it was sort of trapped inside of universities and private companies, make that knowledge public, make it uh, public in a way that was scholarly and solid and vetted with peer review, uh, and then connect that to public writing too, so that you could show people the pathway to the place where the deeper thinking was available. Okay, so let's get to the main event. Let's start discussing testing. Can one of you provide me with a list of the major components that would go into a robust testing program that the roadmap discusses. Glenn, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, so um, it's very important to highlight that while testing is a critical component, at least as important for our framework is tracing and supported isolation. And in fact, even in some locations where it may be very hard to get testing capacity up, we want to lean even more on tracing and supported isolation. Um, and the, the reason is that universal routine testing is both highly invasive and very costly to perform. And it's, it's based exclusively on the idea that, you know, a recent negative test is, is your um, calling card. Whereas what we're really looking to achieve is not a routine testing in an environment where the disease is pervasive and the only thing that's keeping you safe is that recent negative test. Instead, we want to suppress the disease to eliminate it from the population as much as possible, as they've done in almost all the Asian and Australasian countries. And to do that, you need to search out the disease everywhere that it lives. You need to find the people who have it and you need to put them in conditions where they get the treatments and the support that they need to not transmit that disease to other people. And the thing to note about this is that while it may seem like this is just some framework, it actually turns out amazingly, much more than we even realized at the beginning, that the only framework that has either managed to get economies going or to save large numbers of the lives that are uh, available to be saved, um, has been testing, tracing, and supported isolation. Um, the countries that have attempted to go to herd immunity have just failed to bring their economy uh, back to life. Sweden's economy is down just as much as Italy's and France's are, which have locked down hard. They've, they've actually seen almost zero economic benefit from having done that because people are too afraid to go outside. Um, conversely, uh, no matter how hard you lock down, there are 40% of people out there who are essential workers and who are gonna keep doing their jobs, keep unfortunately being exposed to the disease and keep exposing the very vulnerable populations they serve to the disease. Um, so lockdowns on their own without trust and tracing supportive isolation will not save the vast majority of the lives, they'll, they'll save some part of the lives, but they will not save nearly all of the lives that could be saved by actually suppressing the disease using testing, tracing, and supported isolation. So Glenn, the essence of testing, tracing, and supported isolation, sorry, yeah, go ahead, Carmel, please. I was, oh, sorry. I was going to ask, 
you mentioned that there are some countries that have followed this model of testing, tracing, and supportive isolation to great success. How much were those a model for what's articulated in the roadmap? And what were the challenges of translating the experience of maybe in Australia or New Zealand that are island nations with much smaller populations to the realities of the US? Um, Danielle, do you want to go on that or should I continue? Go for it then. Okay. So um, the, the, the interesting thing is actually there's a huge amount of diversity across all these cases in terms of details. Um, the only commonality across China, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, et cetera, that all of us successfully um, uh, suppressed the disease were these three core elements, testing, tracing, and supported isolation. Beyond that, really the main elements that we drew from these different cases were the abstract commonalities across them. There was a certain level of testing that was required to do the tracing. And so we drew quantitative estimates from that. There was a necessity, especially in dense areas, to both do very intensive and precise tracing of personal contacts that people were aware of, but also to ensure that public spaces were not uh, sites of uncontrolled transmission of the disease. And that required different measures in different places, whether it was improving the infrastructure physically, adding some technology, relying on some digital components. So there were, there were many different ways of doing those things. And the context of the American federal system calls on us to implement and think about those in a different way than, for example, uh, might happen in uh, South Korea, which is a much more uh, a centralized um, governance uh, model. Um, Danielle did some very creative thinking about the federal system. Uh, we were also inspired by what the Germans did because they have some very similar federal uh, institutions. Um, I, I don't want to go on uh, too long, but, but the key point is that we really looked for the commonalities across the successful cases, abstracted those elements, and then took those abstracted elements to the context of the American Federal Republic and tried to think about in that context uh, how things could most successfully play out. So here I'm going to have a few questions for our law professor. Glenn just mentioned federalism, and now I remember what federalism is because I have survived one all year of law school, but not everybody in our audience has gone to law school. Could you talk to us a little bit about what federalism is and why is it relevant to pandemic response? Yeah, happy to. So um, the United States has a federal system of government. What that means is that we have a national government. Uh, we think of that as the, the, we call that the federal government in Washington, D.C. Uh, and then we have the state governments. Um, and that's the federal system. It's divided power between a federal, a national government and state governments. Um, within the states, we actually have a further decentralized system where we have local governments, tribal governments, uh, and, and those are organized differently in different states. Uh, in some places, there are counties that are very powerful. In other places, cities are very powerful. Um, and they're all governed differently. Some places have strong mayors, some places have weak mayor systems. Um, so there's a large amount of diversity in how we govern ourselves at the local level. Um, and then there's diversity at the state level. Uh, and then there's one approach at the, the national level. Um, and so part of the challenge for how we think about public policy in the context of this federal system uh, is twofold. One is to what extent um, are there powers that are allocated at these different levels? Uh, and as we've seen so far in the pandemic, there are lots of powers at the state level. The state has something called the police power, um, and the state is able to address a wide variety of things uh, as the kind of first mover on public policy, and, and particularly uh, in the situation of a public health crisis. Um, and then there's other powers that we have at the federal level. Um, so one is where's the allocation of powers. Uh, the second thing is what's the best level at which to accomplish something. Um, and it's not always the national government that is best at accomplishing things. Uh, often it is a state or a local uh, official or, or uh, entity that might be better at accomplishing things. And the reason why is that they're closer to the ground. And so they can tailor the particular conditions uh, that they see on the ground, their particular needs. Um, and, and that's a way to accomplish things that may be more successful than directing all policy from 
from Washington. So um, that's a quick overview of how our system is, is set up. One of the great benefits of the, the national government in a crisis is its ability to provide funding, um, to provide coordination, uh, and to be able to uh, engage in additional authorities. Um, you may have, uh, many of you have probably heard of the Defense Production Act as, as one of those authorities, but there are lots of things like that, that the federal government can do um, as well. And so part of what, what we've tried to do in the roadmap and in the additional work uh, in the white papers is really rely on the fact that we have this federal system. Uh, think about what can be done at these different levels. Focus on the local levels where there's a place to think about um, what kind of progress can be made and what are the needs in different kind of areas depending on the level of prevalence in those areas. Uh, and also make recommendations on the policy side of what the federal government, the national government could do, um, or how the national government could support uh, state governments and local governments as well. So let's talk a little bit about everybody's different responsibilities in this roadmap. You mentioned that states will have the ability to tailor their response for their local realities. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Do you want me to jump in on that, Ganesh, or do you want to? Sure. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I think Ganesh said it exactly right. And uh, as we were doing work on this, I had one really wonderful conversation with um, a worker in healthcare in Illinois, somebody in the sort of public health structure there. And she remarked, when you've seen one public health system in a state in America, you've seen one public health system in a state in America. And that's really the critical point, that every state has a different structure for how public health is delivered. So in some cases you have community, uh, uh, community health centers. In other cases, you have uh, municipal health offices. In other cases, you have county health offices. So the question of exactly how public health work is conducted in a given state is, is literally there are 50 different answers to that. As a consequence, when you're thinking about how do you set up a program to do diagnostic testing, that's primarily what we're talking about here, diagnostic testing to see if there's active virus of an individual, the question of who's even going to do that will be answered differently in any given state. So that's where you really need sort of state tailoring to come in, where states understand their organizational structure and can figure out the most effective and efficient way of ensuring that trustworthy um, organizations and entities have that first line responsibility for working with the community to run a testing and tracing program. I think the thing that needs to be consistent across states has to do with due process protections, non-discrimination protections, civil liberties protections and things like that. And that's where the existence of something like, you know, there's the, the model public health emergency law that helps all states think about how public health emergency powers should be used. Um, and also, of course, there's the constitutional requirements that the states adhere to uh, due process, um, equal protection and so forth. Um, so in that regard, it does matter that there's a broader constitutional frame protecting civil rights and liberties within which states are doing their work. Um, but it matters that states be able to tailor the specific organization of policy implementation to the context. So here I actually want to pull one of our audience questions. They're interested in what is the smallest region that can implement this plan? So for example, could a single state implement the plan or could a region like the Bay Area implement it? Or does it have to be a national response? Oh, well, that's a beautiful question. And I love, I think the best example is the city of Vaux, Italy, 3000 people in one city and they ran this program for themselves. So no, you can be a quite small unit. And in fact, I think what's likely to happen is that you will see um, municipal leaders and county officials collaborating across the country. I, my, my suspicion is that the sort of center of gravity location for this will be precisely a kind of knitting together of counties and several municipalities within that county into a single structure for testing and tracing programs. So there are about more than 4,000 counties um, around uh, the country. Um, and so I think that's probably what, where the center of gravity will be. So I just want to nuance what Danielle said, because I agree. You absolutely can uh, implement these sorts of things at a smaller level. The challenges are two with doing that. One is to the extent that you do that and it's not coordinated with others, you may withdraw resources in order to protect your area that could be much more efficiently allocated to protect everyone in common. It's like trying to defend a single you know, city state rather than having a you know, confederation of city states uh, jointly defend themselves, right? 
Um, and second, without that um, coordination, you may not be able to allow travel from other places because you'll know that they uh, have not suppressed the disease. So you may win a local victory and be able to reopen your quote local economy, but that may not do you very much good if still the economies of so many other places are shut down. And we've seen that like Japan, for example, really has suppressed the virus, and yet they're suffering almost the same economic shock that places that haven't are because they're such an export dependent economy. So as we explore what is the right size to implement this plan, I'm actually going to pull another audience question, which is interested in universities and reopening campuses. This person asks, how feasible is it for a large research university, such as, say, Northeastern University, to implement a testing, contact tracing, and supported isolation program similar to the building block that you're discussing that would be efficient enough to provide reasonable levels of safety for that community? So I think the answer Glenn just gave about the scale question applies here too. So, I mean, it is the case that entities exist that could run programs for themselves. Northeastern could do it, Harvard could do it, University of California, San Diego is working on setting up a program. But the analogy to security is the key one here. So think about terrorism. Um, if there were no national effort to provide broad security, we would see every single organization setting up a much more extensive private security core and so forth to try to protect against the, the possibility of a terrorist event. That's an incredibly inefficient way of collectively achieving security across our society. It also has the disadvantage of drawing an even sharper line between the haves and the have-nots. The organizations that can protect themselves and the communities that can and the communities that just do not have access to the resources to acquire that kind of protection. So the fact of the matter is that just as in the context of protecting against terrorist attacks, here too, we need to achieve safety together through a public program of testing and tracing that is national in its shape and reach, even if it's local in its implementation. Within that context, it makes excellent sense for civil society organizations to contribute their resources to carrying out those programs in their communities. So yes, a Northeastern can and should be ready to do that, but ideally, Northeastern should be doing that in the context of a much broader program that is fully inclusive in its provision of safety and security to the entire population. So we're just gonna keep on getting smaller and smaller and smaller before we expand back to the big picture because we have a question that asks, what can ordinary people do to support this plan? This person who asks it is a data scientist with what he calls a small soapbox. What should he be doing and what should others be doing? So I feel like all three of us should answer this question. So I'd be curious to hear whether our answers are the same or different. So Ganesh, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, I think one of the starting points is, uh, you know, spreading um, good information around in, in your relevant networks and um, whether that's, you know, if, if you have a small soapbox, uh, getting on it and tweeting or or what your preferred uh, uh, you know, social media is. I think that's a way to help um, spread uh, the, the path of this and, and, the, and, the, and the information that's in the, in the um, roadmap. Um, I think the other thing that you, know, you can think about doing is finding ways to be active um, in, in pushing your local officials and state officials and representatives. Um, you know, one of the great things about democracy is that we can uh, actually shape what, what we do as a, as a community. Um, so I would get active in, in trying to help educate those folks, um, but also uh, help push them to, to act. So glad I'm curious to hear your answer. Um, I think that the most important thing in my mind is coordination on the key elements of the um, framework and the communication to as many people as possible, that there is no trade-off between the economy and lives. There's only victory or defeat. Um, and so the more that people can just say, look, we, we want to win this war, we want to be free of this, and we need action by leaders in business and government as soon and decisively as possible, and that if we don't see decisive and clear action, we're going to feel deeply dissatisfied with them and feel that our trust was betrayed. I think that's what needs to be communicated over, overwhelmingly. 
I would agree with those things. So I would say, um, first of all, it's really important to get the message out that COVID-19 is much deadlier than the flu. So I think there's still a myth broadly circulating that they're roughly the same as diseases and that is just not the case. COVID is at least 10 times as fatal as the flu and it is much more infectious than the flu. So I think making sure that people are very clear about those basic facts is key. Um, so that would be point one. Point two would be exactly the one that Glenn made. Um, there is not a question of a trade-off between lives and the economy or lives and livelihoods here. The securing safety and securing lives, are, that is the pathway to restarting the economy. And in addition, we need a functioning economy to secure lives and livelihoods. We need the economy to be activated appropriately in the form of delivering the tests in the supply chain, delivering the personnel to do the contact tracing and so forth in order to protect lives. So really important to get people past that constant uh, characterization of the question as a trade-off against those things. As Glenn pointed out, it's the economies um, in South Asia and Asia um, that have in fact secured protection for life that are seeing, have seen growth this past quarter in their, in their gross domestic product, right? So that is you know, the best evidence there is that there's not a trade-off between um, lives and the economy. And then I think Ganesh is exactly right, that it really is about making sure decision makers, um, particularly state level decision makers and uh, members of Congress are clear about their roles in implementing a testing, tracing and supported isolation or TTSI program for all of us. So governors really do need to set targets for their states and they really do need to activate their local health officials in setting testing targets and goals. A different way to think about those goals rather than focusing on the quantity of tests is to get everybody focused on our need to trace and test all contacts. So we should not rest. We should be tireless in our efforts to find the disease and the virus wherever it is happening to live. So that means, again, when somebody tests positive, we have to find their contacts. We have to test those contacts. It's not enough just to quarantine those contacts because the disease moves too quickly and it passes too much through asymptomatic or presymptomatic transmission. So as soon as we find a group of contacts, we really have to, to test them immediately, find everybody who's positive and test their contacts as well, and so on down the chain. So I think that's the thing to get people to focus on, the need really to keep testing and tracing and testing and tracing and doing that repeatedly to find all those cases. That should be the focus. One way to think about it is search and destroy, right? That's the military attitude, right? You, you, find, you find the enemy and you, you root the enemy out. And similarly here, we need to find the disease and we need to isolate the disease so it can't spread. Right, that's the hard part. You gotta separate it from the human beings who are the hosts, protecting the human beings who are the hosts, right? So that's the really critical thing. So before we get on the topic of what this looks like in the American economy. We have a follow-up question to Glenn's more comparative discussion of economies around the globe. Somebody is interested in the Sweden example. So she asks if it is an incorrect understanding that they have suffered a comparable economic hit and lost a comparable number of lives to many other European countries when they may potentially emerge with herd immunity, which would be advantageous in the long run. So I think essentially what she's asking is, yeah, it might look comparable right now, but maybe Sweden's going to have the last laugh in five years. Okay, so that's a great question. So first of all, Sweden has lost about three times as many lives as comparable Scandinavian countries per capita. So they have suffered a much uh, greater toll. Their economy has not done any better. And uh, they it's conceivable, I think it's very unlikely, but it's conceivable that they're gonna emerge with herd immunity after many more months of suffering and deaths. Um, but uh, that will have been purchased at, at the cost of having lost the lives of most of the people who could potentially have lost the lives. It also bears noting that Sweden is the most rural economy uh, of, I believe any country in the OECD, that might not be quite right, but certainly among the very wealthy countries in the OECD. And so there's a certain sense in which um, the disease had a little bit less chance to spread 
uh, in Sweden and that insulated them from the worst possible consequences. But it is clear that they got many more deaths, no near-term economic benefit, probably a very minimal longer-term economic benefit, if any, um, and certainly less economic benefit than if they'd actually suppressed the disease uh, be because the Asian economies have bounced back far more aggressively than Sweden has. On that last point, just as an additional footnote, um, I mean, the German context is very close to the Swedish context. And I was um, privileged to have a conversation a week or so ago with the head of the German CDC. And his response to the question about Sweden was, um, actually, you know, it's not the case that they've just gone on as normal, that Germany's been tracking very closely what's actually happened in Sweden, and they've measured similar degrees of social distancing in Sweden to in Germany. So Sweden probably doesn't actually have as much herd immunity or, or as much progress toward it as it looks. And in fact, they, they've actually been doing social distancing, um, yet have had this higher per capita um, level of deaths. So in the contrast between Germany, I think Germany has been much more aggressive about testing and tracing and finding the disease as well. So the Swedish case is really, there's a lot more to it than um, meets the eye in the kind of public representations of it at the moment. So I want to talk a little bit more about what testing and supportive isolation looks like. So we have a question where somebody is very concerned about whether this strategy would mean separating parents from their kids. If either the parents tested positive or the kids tested positive, they're worried that if there's a positive test in the family, the government will come and isolate you outside of your home. And that if both parents would have it, that the children would be in temporary, perhaps government care for a while. Is this something that is possible? Is this something that you anticipate ever being part of the plan, I'm sure there are some anxious parents asking those questions. It's a reasonable source of anxiety. And I think what we've put the emphasis on is supported voluntary isolation. So the goal is to build isolation programs that make it reasonable for people to do. So that does mean that in cases where you have families where their children or their elder care issues that you really are providing high quality child care, elder care to fill in while somebody needs to be in isolation. At the end of the day, I think if a parent really considers the relevant uh, risk of having um, a child care situation for a period of time as against exposing their child to a disease where we continue not to have full clarity about the kinds of vulnerabilities different people have. Um, I think the risk is really more on the side of the danger of exposure, to be honest, than um, on the side of the provision of childcare. So in other words, the point is, most importantly, that that is why resources um, to provide support and isolation are so important, because it really has to be giving people an opportunity to take themselves out of circulation in ways that doesn't endanger their family, in ways that don't endanger their, uh, their livelihood, so that people need income protection and job protection if they're going to go into isolation, et cetera. So there are already efforts to do this. Massachusetts has developed um, isolation facilities, drawing on hotels. And in some sense, you do have to think of it as involving the kind of resources and supports of a social work context. Also important to recognize that what will be necessary will vary quite considerably from case to case. Um, and again, I mean, we have put our emphasis on building voluntary programs where the incentives of isolating are structured in ways that make it the choice that people will want to make. So we have a question that is actually a great follow up question to your last point. How much of this plan depends on voluntary compliance by individuals and what kind of numbers do we have to see opt in for this plan to work? Glenn, do you want to speak to that one or do you want me to take yeah, it? So I I, I would like to see, so the first thing I, I want to make clear is that I think the word voluntary is a very slippery one because the reality is that almost all social programs involve the um, provision of various inducements that make a decision, especially for people in vulnerable positions, more attractive in certain cases than others. Um, and whether that you call that voluntary or not is a little bit uh, of a slippery term. But we do support, we want these to be programs that people want to be participating in in the normal course of their lives, because otherwise they're going to do all sorts of things to undermine the operation of the program and to either avoid or, you know, seek out 
the chance to get the disease, which we do not want people to do. So we want carefully designed incentives so that people will, in general, go about their normal lives and then choose to isolate if they are exposed to the disease. Um, and we want to achieve that with a high degree of fidelity. So we want, I don't know, 80, 90% of people to choose to reasonably isolate themselves, but there will be uh, quite a lot of heterogeneity in the precise meaning of that. So, um, you know, to come back to Danielle's point, I think that there will be people who feel that they just cannot be separated from their vulnerable or autistic or, you know, whatever the nature of their child's situation is. And it may be necessary for that child to go into isolation with them. And it may be that they're, they're within a population group where there's a very, very low risk that that child's life will be in danger. Um, and I think that's a choice that some people will make and, and that I, I don't know if Danielle agrees, but I would like to make accommodations for that to be a possible alternative for people who, you know, where that's, uh, where there's a good argument for why that should be the case. Yep, no, I agree with that. So as we're having this discussion of what supportive isolation could look like, a question that occurs to me is that the U.S. has had a complicated relationship to social support. This is a country that does not have universal health care. This is a country in which a lot of people have either very limited or perhaps no sick leave. Are this attitude to social support a barrier to succeeding in this testing program and in combating the pandemic? Because people will say, economically, I can't stay home. I can't get the care that I need. Ganesh, do you want to speak to that one? Or I'm happy to too, but, if, but I know you've been thinking about right. it as well. When you start. Oh, sure. No, I, I, think, I think you have put your finger on a fundamental issue. And so I think one of the challenges facing us in this pandemic is that to fight a pandemic, you need the resources and resilience of a healthy social contract. You need the resources of a world where people understand things are asked of them, their responsibilities that they have to meet. And in exchange for those responsibilities, they receive protections from the community and from society as a whole. And I do think that um, our social contract is not healthy. And in an important way, our vulnerability to the pandemic is a direct reflection of the areas where our social contract is weak. Um, our infection fatality rate is likely to be higher here than, for example, in Germany, precisely because our underlying provision of health care is not as good as in Germany. So our population is more vulnerable. That has supported the spread of the disease, and that's you know, part of why we have higher levels and rates of prevalence. So in that regard, yes, we do have to fight the pandemic um, with the resources of, uh, of social contract that isn't altogether healthy, which means I think we have to be quite intentional about strengthening the social contract in this moment. So I do think that the policies of supported isolation um, can and should be understood as an opportunity to strengthen a social contract that has been insufficiently robust. So yes, uh, you're right that there's a political challenge around that. Um, but I think the important point is this is a really powerful moment for recognizing that an, an unhealthy social contract puts us all at risk. It makes us all vulnerable. And an economy that's pandemic resilient that avoids the broad spread of a novel infectious pathogen will be one where there is universal provision of healthcare and there is a sturdy foundation um, of health supports. So at the moment, we need to plug a hole um, with isolation supports and it's in the interest of all of us that we do so. It's, it's not just a good or a benefit that is being um, dispensed, so to speak, to those who need to isolate. It actually reduces prevalence of the disease in the society broadly and thereby restores security for all of us. And that is the point of a social contract. You build and provide public goods because it is in the interest of the whole. And that's what we're talking about here. So can I just guess and you a little bit, Danielle, which is to say, uh, I agree. And, in, and I sort of actually agree with everything that Danielle said. I would just say that I don't think you need to take a, I don't think you need to go all the way to what Danielle said in order to agree that this program can be made to work. Uh, the, the reason I would say that is we are much better in this country at providing temporary support 
and we're much more consistent about providing temporary support in emergency situations than we are at providing ongoing support for more routine situations. And we're especially good at providing temporary support when there is a clear and material interest that the rest of the population can very clearly um, cognize in supporting those groups than when it can't. So we do a much better job in many, especially many historical episodes in supporting our military um, than we do in supporting uh, many other elements of our society. We've done a much better job of providing, in many cases, emergency assistance than we do in providing unemployment uh, support or support for family and child you know, leave and, and things like this. So I, I do believe that even if we aren't able to fully solve the underlying problems that Danielle highlighted, that there are sort of traditions that many people across the political spectrum will recognize that will make them sympathetic to, in this circumstance, addressing um, the, the needs of the moment. I'll just, I'll just add that I think one of the striking things about this moment um, is how massive it is um, and that it is a, a wake-up call for a lot of people um, who, who may not have thought it as high a priority uh, to actually go back and try to improve our social contract, as Danielle said. Uh, one of the striking things throughout our history is that big changes happen often in response to big crises, um, either in the middle of them or right after them. And so I think one of the questions here is what kinds of changes should we demand coming out of uh, or in the midst of this crisis um, in order to make sure that our country is more resilient in the future. You know, I think we, we think of this as a major uh, crisis that we're living through right now, um, and it certainly is, but we should, not, uh, we, we should not forget that it may be the case that there are more pandemics that may come down the road once we get through this one um, in five years or 10 years, and there will be other kinds of crises. And, and we should try to build a resilient society so that we can weather all of them uh, better than we are weathering this one currently. So let's continue with this section, which I'm starting to think of as the political realities of our country hitting up against a very well considered, well thought out plan. We have a question from an audience member. How can we implement a workable nationwide plan when so many states are opening up without any real plan? He goes on to say, and I want to say this is not the official position of the Petrie Flom Center or the Edmund J. Stafford Center. It seems that we need federal oversight, but at the moment, Congress and the president don't seem capable of accomplishing this. Go for it, Ganesh. You're starting. Go for it. Well, I'll, I'll highlight one part of the, the plan. You know, we proposed as part of the, the roadmap um, the creation of a pandemic testing board, which would be uh, comprised of people from business, uh, government, academia, um, public health, lots of different uh, areas of expertise and experience uh, to come together and work on uh, creating the everything that we need to make the system of testing, tracing, and supported isolation uh, possible. So that's the production of the supply of all the tests, it's distributing the tests uh, throughout the country, it's coordinating on all of those issues so that we can match the supply to where there's demand and where there's need. Um, and that pandemic board, um, you know, we've actually talked about and, and put forward in the roadmap uh, different ways that it could be designed. So one approach for that design would be for it to operate through the national government. Congress would pass a law creating the thing, it would operate within the executive branch. Um, but to your to the to the questioner's comment, you know, you don't need to rely on that necessarily. Another approach uh, that we outline is to for, for there to be a um, interstate uh, compact. Um, this is a little known constitutional provision that allows the states to get together and come up with an agreement, um, allows Congress to bless that agreement, uh, and then that agreement takes on additional force within the states. It has the status of federal law, it is supreme over state law. Um, Congress is allowed to fund those, those compacts and can provide additional resources into them. Um, and the states can then take on a lot of action in order to be able to coordinate um, activities. Uh, right now, we've already seen in some regions uh, in the West, in the Midwest, and on the East, uh, in the Northeast, um, states coming together in sort of loose regional agreements to try to do some coordination 
uh, in different areas. Uh, a compact would really strengthen that and take it to a different level by adding additional legal authority um, and having Congress appropriate funding for that activity. And so we think that one approach to trying to address this is to have a pandemic testing board, um, but created through the mechanism of an interstate compact. It would be then operated by the states, run through the states, um, but it would have considerable more funding because it would get the federal funding uh, that the states need to be able to actually implement a program on the scale that we're talking about, where we're really doing millions of tests a day. And, and I, just to follow up on what Ganesh said, I wanted to talk just very briefly about the financing side. There's also a question of whether there will be federal financing. And I, and I, you know, obviously for the reasons Ganesh said, it would be great if that happened. But even if it doesn't happen, I think that there are some good pathways available here. Um, and uh, Glenn, Al uh, Glenn Hubbard uh, and uh, Rajiv Sethi, uh, both from Columbia University, wrote a nice piece on, in The Hill about this. The Federal Reserve has already started buying some municipal bonds and could buy significantly more. And many of the regions that most hard hit are actually, while they have uh, lower income people within them, overall quite wealthy areas, um, especially with very high real estate values. And there is quite a bit of capacity there to do what really should have been done many years ago, which is significantly increase property taxes in many of those regions. Um, and that, you know, obviously you don't want to do that in the middle of the economic depression, but, um, but you could backstop those uh, Federal Reserve purchases of local bonds uh, with a promise to uh, fund them through increased property tax revenues. So I think that there are potentially non-federal pathways here, uh, even for the financing of this. So that goes to a great audience question, which is interested in governance systems that have the capacity to respond to COVID-19, including a capacity to measure how we are doing through testing and tracing, but also capacity to promote and protect equity and pay attention to the equity implications of policies and programs in both public health and to support the economy. Are there any cities, regions, counties that you think have been effective at balancing these competing challenges of addressing the pandemic while keeping in mind the need to promote equity as well as to address the questions around the economy? So I'm sure we could all point to examples where people are setting a path um, worthy of emulation and attention. Um, so Massachusetts um, absolutely is focused on that. So in a number of different dimensions, Massachusetts was really the first place to try to start building up a significant contact tracing program through partnership between Partners in Health, Paul Farmer's organization and the state of Massachusetts. So they've got about 1300 contact tracers working at this point and they absolutely are connecting that to doing work in the most vulnerable communities and the um, area hospitals have begun setting up testing clinics in the most hard hit communities. We have some communities like Chelsea, for example, where the prevalence level is just completely different from the rest of Massachusetts. It's a real tragedy. And the hospitals are really taking that on board and figuring out how to get treatment resources to people. There is a lot of work to do around public communications because we did so much work um, to instill in people the sense that they should stay in their homes. There's a lot of fear about leaving home, a lot of fear about going to clinics, going to hospitals. And so there are people who really need treatment who aren't getting it. And so I think people are also giving thought and attention to the question of how you, in fact, communicate to people that there are resources. So in Massachusetts, the federally um, qualified health centers are also putting a lot of work and time and investment into culturally competent um, training or sort of training cultural competence for contact tracers and making sure that the resources are available to connect to communities in the languages that they use um, with the patterns of communication interaction um, that they're used to. You can point to examples like that as well in New Orleans where there are lots of mobile labs um, in operation to reach more vulnerable high risk uh, populations and Oregon too, I think stands out for the quality of the testing and tracing programs that it's starting to develop. Danielle, I actually have two follow up questions from our audience that relate to things you've talked about in that answer. The first is, does the Massachusetts Partners in Health collaboration represent in your mind the preferred approach or do you have any concerns about it? The second is a great question about the Gates Foundation's 
potential solution to the problem of testing, they are trying to make very low cost home sample collection kits available to the public where the testing and test reporting functions are provided by CLIA and CAP accredited labs, but you can do it in the comfort of your home, perhaps to address the fact that people now are fearful of leaving their houses. Do you have any thoughts either about the Partners in Health collaboration or the Gates Foundation's push to develop that at-home testing kit? I think these are both valuable things. And I think really what we need to be doing is pushing on all modalities simultaneously. There's not an either or choice at all. Um, if we can get, you know, good ramp up a production of home kits that are of high quality, of high sensitivity, we should absolutely pursue that path. In addition to the Gates Foundation work, um, there's a scientist at Rutgers, Andrew Brooks, who's developed a, sci a saliva test, which is also now available in a home kit. There's a distributor in Colorado who's begun to manufacture them. I think there's still some things to learn about the degree of sensitivity of those tests. So that's a thing to track and watch, but um, we should be, we should be really working across all modalities. The Partners in Health program, I think is a very, very good one. Um, it needs to be scaled up. So even 1300 contact tracers, that sounds like a lot. It's not actually enough. Um, if what you really wanna do is find every case and make sure people have support for isolation. So um, it's a good start. It's headed in the right direction, but we have to build on it. So I'm aware that we only have a few minutes left in this event and that sitting on Zoom is not as fun as being in person. For one, we don't have any refreshments to offer our audience. And so I want to get into the wrap up portion and I would like to ask each of our panelists to answer the following question. If you had to summarize the key takeaway points on testing and tracing made in the roadmap in a tweet, so, you know, you have maybe 280 characters here. What would you tweet to our audience? Save lives, liberties, and livelihoods with testing, tracing, and supported isolation. The only way we can get the economy going is to give people the confidence to go back outside by finding the disease wherever it hides, isolating it, um, and yeah, and isolating it. Um, I'd probably say something like, uh, the way we reopen is with millions of tests a day and that needs to be a much greater part of our focus. And then I would add, and COVID is 10 times more deadly than the flu. I think you should definitely tweet that out. Before we wrap up, I wanna say a couple of things. First of all, if you have enjoyed this event, again, next week, I believe at this time on Thursday, there will be a similar event, but discussing the impact of pandemic resilience for work and for schools, please join us for that. And then, Danielle, before we wrap up, I think it's very clear from these questions that a lot of people have read the Pandemic Resilience Roadmap and the other materials that the Edmund J. Saffer Center has put out in its rapid response to COVID-19. But for people who have listened to this event and they are really excited to read the materials, do you have any recommendations for where to start? What is book one in this fantasy series? Sure, so you can go to the website pandemictesting.org, pandemictesting.org. And I would actually probably start with the report we put out uh, earlier this week. It's called Pandemic Resilience, Getting It Done. Um, that's where I would start, even though it's the last thing that came out. Um, we've been learning as we've gone. And so I think everything that we've done reflects um, a greater depth of thought. So I would start there. And by the way, that's for reading. If you want something very quick, there are some really great video resources and maps available that can be consumed more quickly. Also on the same website, pandemictesting.org. So it's a Saffir Center website that we're hosting all these materials. Excellent. So that's pandemictesting.org, everyone. And with that, our hour is up. 
I want to thank our three panelists. This has been an amazing discussion. Thank you for sharing your insights on what it will take to get us to testing, contact tracing, and supportive isolation to hopefully get us out of our homes and restart the economy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carmel. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.